Welcome to this episode of The Sit Down. Today we're joined by Mary Turner Thompson, who is a best-selling author of The Bigamist. Mary met a man who she ended up marrying and having children with, only to find out he is not the man she thought he was. Mary, welcome to The Sit Down. Hi, nice to be here. So just to start, I would be interested in knowing a little bit more about how your life was before you met him. Sure, yeah. I was um, 33, I think, before I met him, 34 when I... No, I was about 34, 35. Um, I can't even remember, it's terrible. Um, and I was a single mum. I had a one-year-old daughter. I was a business advisor for the Scottish Enterprise Network. So I was kind of a professional busybody. I would walk into people's companies and tell them how to run them better, which was quite a fun job. <laughs> um, and uh, one of my friends said, you know, um, there's this newfangled thing called online dating, you know. Why don't you try doing it? So what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Famous last words. Indeed. So, so you met um, you met William uh, online. Yeah. And did he contact you? Did you contact him? He contacted me. Okay. So I'd actually um, done online dating and had tried three different chaps I'd dated and, and it just didn't work out. So I deactivated oh. my, my thing, but because they wanted to pad out their numbers. I mean, it was the early days, of so course. you didn't have much rights. Uh, and uh, so I randomly got this message from him, you know, a few months after I deactivated my account. And uh, yeah, so yeah, he contacted me. He didn't actually have a profile, so it wasn't anything for me to check out. It was oh, just him okay. contacting people. And I don't think it's so easy to do that nowadays. No, no. definitely this not. This was in 2000, so it was very early days of online dating. Okay. And how, how did he attract you in the beginning? Um, well, he, he he just seemed so charming and rational and kind and straightforward. And I mean, the first email he sent me told me that he couldn't have kids due to about mumps as a child. So, you know, he seemed to be very open and, you know, just, just came across as extremely genuine. Um, and uh, very similar things in common. We read the same books. We liked the same films. Um, just really connected. So in the beginning, kind of a very normal as you would expect, yeah. exciting new relationship. Yeah. I mean, I, I spoke to him for about two weeks online. Um, I wanted to sort of get to know him really well before I met him because I didn't want to really invest my time in meeting him if he was going to be, if it wasn't going to work in that way. So, I mean, I talked to him for about two weeks and told him so much about me and he told me so much about him. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, I realised now that was probably a mistake, but at the time I thought I was being, doing my due diligence and actually getting to know him. Um, but it wasn't really him I was getting to know. So when you say it, it wasn't really him you were getting to know. It was completely the opposite. He was getting to know me. So by sharing things about himself, I would share things about myself. And therefore, he was getting to know who I was, what made me tick, um, what what kind of things I liked, what would what would make me happy, what I was looking for in a relationship, etc. And he was moulding himself into being the perfect man for me. Wow, so he's like a chameleon. Yeah, very much so. So... <laughs> The man that you were getting to know, or you thought you were getting to know, who was who was that man? Who is that man that you, you were? Oh, the, the man that I thought he was, the yes. man he portrayed to be. He was an IT consultant. He was somebody who was um, polite, well-mannered, uh, gentlemanly, strong, humble, talented. He could play the piano uh, better than I could, and I used to play concerts when I was 11. Um, and he sat down and played the piano and, you know, played jazz, he played pop, he played classical, he played all these different things. Wow. Only a few bars, and then he'd stop. And he, he, he was a bit shy, and, and he would stop and not, not continue and just go, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not very good anymore, even though he was actually brilliant. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it, all these kind of things. So it's, it was music, it was, it was films, it was art, it was literature, it was politics it was talking you know we just had so much in common and uh yeah it was uh, none of it was real though you see everything was he was researching me and if I mentioned a book he would find the book he would read it you know then we could talk about it but he he made it sound like he he had read it before I'd mentioned it can you remember the day of course you can't it must be a very clear day for you the day you found out that he wasn't the man you thought he was. Oh, yes. It was It was the 6th of April, 2006. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> how, how did you find out? Was it was it a stream of lies that unfolded that he couldn't control? How did you find out he wasn't who he said he was? <clears throat> it was, by the time I found out, my life was so bizarre and so terrifying. Um, I mean, it was six years after I first met him. 
and we had two children by this time, miracle children, who, you know, his parents had been so pleased to have their first grandchild, etc. Um, and uh, I found out on the 6th of April 2006 because his other wife phoned me um, and uh, informed me that not only had she got five children to him, but the nanny had two children to him, that we knew of a child in America that was born when he was only 18 years old. Um, you know, so it just the, the, the number of children we knew at that time was 10. Um, and certainly the nanny and the, and the wife were both pregnant when he first wrote to me saying he was infertile and couldn't have children. So his, his other wife's, the nanny they employed, yeah. was also pregnant with his children. Yes. So my, my now 17-year-old has three 17-year-old siblings. Wow, okay. So, and I now know 14 children by, I don't know, eight different women. Uh, I lose count, it's terrible. But that, that will be the tip of the iceberg because there's more likely to be 40. These are just the ones that have contacted me. So these are the ones that have read my book, know the situation, have realised who the, the father of the child is and have contacted me. So this will not be the extent of his children. That is just the very tip of the iceberg. How did he maintain relationships with other people in terms of because he's living with you, right? Well, he was, yeah, he, he works away. So, I mean, one of the things he told me quite early on when I started suspecting he was doing um, some odd things is he actually persuaded me that he was working for the intelligence services. And that sounds awfully bizarre because it sounds like he said, hey, babe, I'm a spy. <laughs> but, you know, it's not like a secondhand car salesman. He, he mm -hmm. explained it away. He's an IT guy, but he just happened to work for the intelligence services. So he was he was more like the guy in the van yes. than James Bond. You know? yeah, yeah. And it's like and he seemed like the kind of person that would do that. You know, he was very, very. Um, detailed very um articulate very good at it uh and so he was away a lot so just like a lot of people who do contracts <clears throat> they're away a lot or oil contracts or oil rigs you know they're away a lot and uh one of the contracts he was doing at the time was he actually worked in the, the office of the deputy prime minister which he genuinely did do right we he was paid by them we know that he genuinely did do that um but he he wasn't there because he was working with the intelligence services. He was there because he was doing an IT contract with them. Okay. But he used that to persuade me and his other wife and five of his fiancés that year that he was actually working for the government and working for the intelligence services. So he actually, and one of the things he also did, he, he took us all to Phantom of the Opera and he took us all to the same Japanese restaurant. And it's like, we, we kind of have a suspicion that him taking us all to Phantom of the Opera was rather like... You know, Phantom of the Opera is about one guy controlling one woman. Mm -hmm. Whereas we kind of think he was sitting there going, you might be able to do it to one woman, but look what I can do. And it's like, you know, there's a little bit of kind of in him doing that. But I think also it was easier for him because he could then refer to that date without having to think which one he'd taken them to. So. When you received that phone call from his other wife, mm -hmm. how how did you know to believe her? Because surely with everything he had told you you know at that moment your reality is not necessarily the same as other people's reality where your yeah. husband's in the security services he works away you know there's an element of um i don't want to use the word you know sexiness but there's an element of there it's, is it's different danger yeah. yeah and he's doing an important job and and you know there would be an element of, of pride there for you as, yeah. as well thinking you know i'm happy with what you do how did you know to to believe what this woman was saying. it's This is why I had to write the book. It takes 60,000 words just to explain to people what happened. <laughs> but put, put in a sort of a brief, brief way, by that time, I was living in abject terror. I mean, I had, he, he'd persuaded me that um, unsavouries had discovered our whereabouts as his family. And they were going to kidnap the kids and rip bits off them and send them through the post to us unless we came up with money. So we were effectively being blackmailed. And at the time, you know, he was working for a big software company and was earning about £10,000 a month. But I'd sold my flat and raised £165,000, which was gone within six months. You know, I'd sold my life insurance policy. I'd sold everything I owned to raise money to keep my children safe. And, you know, bear in mind, this is not uh, just somebody out of the blue going, we need money, so we're being blackmailed. By this time, we were four years into the relationship and I was completely brainwashed. This He is the the definition of coercive control 
So it's like over a long period of time. I mean, it's one of the things I'm writing about, I've written about in the new book that's coming out, The Psychopath, is how he did it. So in The Bigamist, I talk about what he did. But actually now I've actually looked at language and, you know, attitude and the, the way he manipulated me. So I've actually sort of been able to zoom out and, and analyse that. But I was coercively controlled. So by the time that was all happening, I was living in such fear that when she contacted me and she called me, it was like somebody had, it's like coming out of the Matrix. It was the red pill. Wow. And, you know, it was just suddenly, you know, it's that the everything, I mean, it's like what felt like my physical walls around me just crumbled. And it's like the very foundation of what, what he, you know, what he told me just disappeared. And just I could see the truth for what it really was. So it, it's, it's a really hard way to explain. But yes, I did believe her. She also jumped in a car, drove straight up to see me. And we went to a cafe and we sat down and talked and she pulled out photographs of her children. And I don't know if you've ever seen the Midwich Cuckoos, but no. they all look alike. All his children, you can tell they're brothers and sisters. So the, 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 my, my daughter has three sisters. Uh, so my 17-year-old daughter has three sisters, two of which are 17 and one that's, uh, sorry, it's 18 now. What am I oh, forgetting? No, it's old age. It's lockdown. It's, it's <laughs> lockdown, yeah. So she's turned 18. But yeah, so they're all, you know, that age group. And, and a brother that is as well. But if you look at the girls, they look like triplets. Wow. So, you know, you can really, it's not a matter of going, oh, well, it might not be. You know, you look at them and go, oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's like that was the kind of physical evidence that showed me that, yeah, she was telling the truth. And, um, yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't, yeah, I wasn't tempted to go, no, I don't believe her. It was just, it was instant. As soon as I heard her story, I knew that it was him. And it was a relief because knowing that actually these shadowy people weren't after us and I might have lost everything. I lost nearly two hundred thousand pounds to him and he had taken out credit cards in my name and used fifty six thousand pounds worth of credit in my name so i was left with debts of fifty six thousand pounds as well so homeless three kids seven four and one and uh this huge debt and uh yeah but it was it was better that than the fact that these people were going to come and kidnap my kids so i felt like i got a get out of jail free card yeah the what i mean what did you do after that conversation she drives up i would imagine you immediately connect with her um because you've went yeah. through the same thing what do you do after that do you have, did, did you did you guys report him to the police did you did you approach him directly was he long gone by that point <laughs> no she she got in the car and drove off and it's, we we were talking for 12 hours uh, and whilst we were talking, she was phoning him uh, and he was answering and because uh, he was he was down with our kids. She was he was actually looking after her kids at the time uh, and she was she was talking and then I, I would phone and he wouldn't answer. Um, and uh, she, we just, you know, she's I think she rang and spoke to his parents as well. And then I realized it was them that talked to me and said they were pleased to have their first grandchild. Um, they just spent Christmas with her and the other five children, by the way. So, um, yeah, they knew what they were doing. They were, They help him. Um, but you know, it and, and she left about six o'clock in the morning, and I sat down in bed and just sat for a moment in shock, and then texted my erstwhile husband and uh, dumped him by text, which I thought was appropriate. <laughs> well, since you don't know him, yeah, yeah so it's, it's but fair, it's right? a, but it's it's that kind of thing. Is that I realised that that I mean, it took me a while. Obviously, I didn't wait. You know, the next day I wasn't all cheerful and happy, but mm -hmm. uh, and it took me a little while to come to terms with it. But it it did feel like a weight off my shoulders because there was I mean things were so bad and things were so scary and yes I'd lost everything but I was I, I kind of see myself like the, the 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 zebra that's got away from the lion yeah you know rather than sitting there going oh dear I got caught by a lion I'm kind of going I got away yeah you yeah. know so I, it gave me the freedom and the control to actually start over and, and have have that you know um ability to to get better and have a decent life again um, and that's that's something that really kind of I think my mother gave me that kind of resilience of you know when things go bad you know once you get through it you can you can get things better again yeah so so he uh, I would imagine uh, I'd imagine the police get involved and did he go to did he go to prison for for his crimes yeah it was actually one of the one of the things that spurred the other wife to call me is that one of his fiancés and he did have five that year uh one of his fiancés had actually brought fraud charges against him mm -hmm. and when they went to the car to because she was he was using her credit card to pay for the car repairs and the car was in my name um and when the police actually arrested him at the car for using her credit card they searched the car and found his wedding certificate to his other wife 
they called me as the owner of the car and said, where's your car? And I said, my husband's driving it. And as a result, they knew he was a bigamist as well. So he was charged with bigamy, fraud, firearms, and not registering his address under the Sex Offenders Act because he's also a convicted paedophile. <laughs> this is a, it's like a rabbit hole, this, this story. It's like you start off at the top and it's just that the bigamist sounds like it's just a guy who is in love with two women. Um, but the further you get into it, the deeper and the darker and the nastier it goes. And it's like, it's so hard to explain to people, you know, quite how dark it goes, but that's what coercive control is like. It's, it's just goes down this rabbit hole. You know? It's, it's, it, it's like an onion. <laughs> layers upon layers upon yeah. layers. Yes. When you said firearm, so he, yes. he had a gun? Uh, a taser. Oh, okay. So, uh, and he was going to go to court. So, in he went to court initially in April two thousand and six, but they kept bumping it up to the Crown Court, etc. So he actually only eventually came to court in November two thousand and six. So for that whole for six months, I had to go around saying, uh, knowing that I was not married, although I was still technically married because there wasn't a bigger mis, you know. Um, but yeah, so in, the, in November he actually pled guilty to um, bigamy, fraud, firearms, and not registering his address under the Sex Offenders Act. Uh, he was initially going to say that he was innocent because the fraud was just a, a girl who had found out he was married and had uh, vindictively brought charges. He was going to say the bigamy, well, you know, I was pregnant and so he felt he had to marry me. He was going to say that the um, firearms, he's American and he didn't think a taser was out of order. You know, he was going to separate off all these little charges yeah. into little chunks so they were manageable. Uh, and I found out this. I found this out, and I actually insisted that they have a victim impact statement from me. And I sat down and I, uh, with a policeman in the Scottish Scottish Police Force. I wrote a victim impact statement saying I had done a lot of research. I had realised that this guy was a psychopath. That this was the history that I now knew of all these different victims and all these different crimes he'd committed, and this was why he was doing all these things. And I tied everything together for the judge. So that they could see this was a pattern of behaviour, not individual yeah. little chunks. It was whole. It was a whole thing, and as a result, he was given a five-year sentence, um, uh, sp split amongst those different crimes, and twenty-one months was the bigamy, and it's the longest. It was the longest conviction, longest sentence for bigamy that's been in since they started recording um, the sentences. Uh, I think there's been a few others since, but that was the first one at yeah. the time, um, which was quite vindicating. Yeah, yeah. indeed, you believe based on his behavior in your own research that he is a, he is a psychopath yes what what behaviors is it that he showed that that makes him a psychopath well there, there's a, a checklist called the dr robert hare uh P, PL, pclr oh, the tongue tied uh, pub, uh psychopath checklist revised is what yeah. it stands for and it's 20 questions and the 20 questions you mark them either zero one or two so zero if you're not at all one if you're not a little bit and two if you're definitely so i mean they, they go down a list like um pathological lying you know so i think we can quite honestly say that he's a pathological liar so you give him two a uh, grandiose sense of self-worth again you know two criminal versatility yeah, he's, you know, lots of different crimes that he's committed. He's been in jail, in and out of jail uh, before and since then. Um, so I think you can give him a two for that. Many marital relationships, that would be two. You know, juvenile delinquency, that would be a two. You know, you can go down the list, each one, and knowing the truth about him, you literally go two, two, two. And he actually scores 40 out of 40 on that checklist. And uh, it's just, you know, he once you... What, but when if I'd done that test on him when I was married to him, I didn't know he was a psychopath. I didn't know he was a pathological liar. I didn't know he'd mm -hmm. had many run out of relationships. You know, I didn't know that he was sexually promiscuous. I didn't know that, you know, all these things. And I would have given him zeros because I didn't know the truth. But now you know the truth. It's it's actually quite easy to identify him as a psychopath. That 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 brings me on to my next question of a lot of time when you see um interviews or stories or, or, or television shows documentaries talking about people's experience that may be slightly sim similar to yours in some mm. in some instances the comments and people's thoughts on this sort of story quite often seem to be geared towards blaming the victim mm -hmm. how could you fall for you know how could you fall for this how naive, because how gullible, they how stupid can you be what, yes, how you've made a fool because they get everything at, from yeah. the, the the end of the story face value from an yes. educational this is what happened perspective yeah. you know they weren't in it what's your thoughts on that kind of attitude towards victims of of that sort of crime i think a hundred years ago women wouldn't come forward if they were raped and they wouldn't come forward because if they if they came forward, they were branded as as 
loose women, mm. uh, for want of a better word, um, and they are un unmarriageable as well, you know, because they've been they've been stained, you know, and it, it we we still have this, we still have this victim shaming culture, but we now and if so if somebody says that they were raped, men or women say they were raped now. Nobody goes, well, you know, we, you, you might have been asking for it. You know, what were you wearing? You know, what were you yes, yes. We now know as a society that that's wrong. Society has changed its opinion. When I first wrote this book, um, actually people said to me, are you going to write it under your own name? Which I thought that that actual question betrays a societal attitude that I think is wrong. You know, I have nothing to be embarrassed about. I have nothing to be ashamed of. I was incredibly naive. I accept that. But I didn't do anything to deserve this. Right. And I'm, I know that 100 percent. And I, I think coming out of that I, and being aware of that made me strong and made me I, I wasn't ever going to be a victim. So as soon as I knew the truth, I felt I could now talk about it. And, you know, I think society does still try and say somebody the victim of a con man. They they're a bit, they're a bit gullible. They're a bit foolish. They're a bit. Uh, and, and I think we just have to stand up and talk about this and say we need to blame the con men, not the victims. Yeah. Yeah, you it's know, very important, I think, actually. one of uh, one or two people that I've spoken to some already, some I'm going to were involved in uh, some serious undercover work. Mm -hmm. One of those individuals is Robert Mazur, um, who is a U.S. federal agent and infiltrated Pablo Escobar's drug cartel, arguably one of the most dangerous men in the world at the time. And I kind of see similarities in what undercover agents do in their behaviors to to infiltrate and get in with these organized criminal groups and with the behaviors of William Allen Jordan and you know other bigamists or con men hmm. because it's and I find it quite difficult sometimes because people will look at undercover agents that movies are made about and they'll look at them as heroes and think oh you did such an amazing job and it's, it's and they did it's hmm. fantastic but they never look at the organized criminals and say you were stupid no they don't that's true they yeah. look at it and say this person did an amazing job to make them believe and look at the work yeah. and the intelligence put in, look at the behavioural yeah. control. But then when we take that exact same situation into a, a personal relationship, like your story, they don't, and I do mean this, they don't give him as much credit as he should get for yeah. the crime he committed. Yeah. They look at the victim. And I, I think that's something that I certainly feel people need to be more aware of as well. Oh, yes, very much so. so. It's, they're very skilled individuals yeah. and intelligent people. Yeah. But you see, I, I mean, it is a societal thing. I get I get letters every day um, from people and I answer every one that I get because I just think these people are, are suffering in pain, you know, etc. And they say, I read your book and it's changed my attitude to it. Um, no, I got one the other day, a lady saying, you know, one of the things about her, about her situation is she... It's not that other people are victim shaming her, but she can't forgive herself for having fallen for the con. She can't forgive herself and let go of the fact that, you know, she lost so much money to this this person. I'm afraid it is a man. It's not all psychopaths and men, but in this case it was. Um, and, you know, she's she's saying to me that I can't forgive myself for being so stupid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I was th this is the problem. People victim shame themselves as well, partly because they're they're part of society. You know, and we look at these sort of mag magazine articles where, you know, and I did it beforehand, before it happened to me. I would look at magazine articles and go, you know, how did the woman not know her husband was a bigamist? How did she not know? You know, it's like, no, come on. You know, so does she not notice? Does she not notice he wasn't there? You know, and it's, it's, it is it's a societal thing. And it's it's when it happens to you, you sort of look at it and go, ah, right. OK, mm, not so easy. You know, we have to, as a society, we live on trust. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't get into a taxi and say, show me your license. And when the guy shows you the license, you ring up the DVLA and just say, I want to check that this is not forged. And then you have to actually speak to the person on the phone's boss to make sure that that person, you know, actually has the qualifications to answer the question, etc., etc., etc. You know, when you go into a restaurant, you can't go and say, I want to see the chef's qualifications. When you go to the doctor, you know, you don't phone the doctor's university to check that they actually did get a degree. Mm. And yet there are doctors, psychopathic doctors in America one in particular I'm thinking of, yes. who actually diagnose people with cancer so they can get the money for the for the radio treatment that they get when there's nothing wrong with them. You know, and, you know, we live on trust. We have to. We ha can't function otherwise. And yet when somebody trusts somebody, they're then told they're foolish. Yes. It just doesn't work. It doesn't fit. There's no other way to live, yeah. though. You can't live otherwise. And it's like people can be sceptical and they can be, you know, sort of like I was naive in the sense that 
I didn't know that psychopaths exist. I, I didn't know that they exist in society the way they do. I thought it was more chance of winning the lottery than there was of actually meeting a psychopath, whereas actually it's 1% of society are out-and-out -out psychopaths. You know, there are 15% of society is on the spectrum. And when you realise that, you kind of like go, oh, you know, you are actually incredibly lucky if you have not been affected by a psychopath in your lifetime. Wow, really? You think about the amount of people you've met. One in a hundred are out and out pure psychopaths, right? 15% on the spectrum. You know, you've had a school teacher, a, a school colleague, a work colleague, a partner, a, you know, sort of like your neighbor. Somebody yeah. in your life has been a psychopath. You might not have identified it. I can now go back through my life and identify three psychopaths that I've been affected by in my lifetime. And I can look back now and go, ah, right, I, I get it now. Yeah. Now I understand why that person I used to work with used to just stir, cause trouble, everything else, you know, because that's that's what psychopaths do. They they are, they get incredibly bored, you know, because they don't have the reward structure of power, sex, and, you know, power, sex, and money is the only reward structure they have. You know, we have the reward structure of having a cuddle from our child. We have, you know, knowing some, knowing we've made somebody happy, knowing we've made a difference, knowing that something, you know, knowing that my book, somebody read my book today, and it changed their lives and it made them feel better about themselves. That to me is a massive reward structure. Somebody who's a psychopath doesn't have that. That means nothing to them. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's like that, that's, you know, so they get incredibly bored. And it's like suddenly you go, oh, right, that's why they did that. You know, so, so it doesn't make sense otherwise. So it's like when you realize that and you realize that these people are prevalent in society, suddenly you start noticing it. You know, the thing that, that amazes me about, uh, learning about this is in behavioral disorders, mental health issues, personality, disorder. personality disorders, is that I don't know if, if the viewers and everyone else is the same, but I always had an idea of what a psychopath was mm -hmm. before I even read a yeah. single article. And I always imagined a psychopath to be a violent, aggressive serial killer, or, you know, someone that would break into your house and do horrible things or, you know, a, they can. a, a physical destructive person that's capable of, yeah horrendous crimes um but after reading it you know about them they're so different than mm. than that well from your experience of, of of dealing with a a psychopath it must be very difficult for people who aren't educated on the behaviors to look out for them and to protect themselves from psychopaths because they're so charming yeah yeah and it's uh, and they're charming for a reason as well because it's, it's just sheer practice um it, it, if you and I go into a pub and, and try to chat somebody up and they reject us, we would kind of go home and lick our wounds for a week or two or maybe a year or two, a decade or two yeah, before you'll yeah, ever actually hurts. do that again. It hurts. Um, because it, a psychopath doesn't get hurt, they would just immediately, as soon as they're rejected, move on to the next person and then the next. So they can go through hundreds of people in one night without actually feeling any emotional uh, detriment from being rejected. So uh, as a result, they learn at a, an incredible rate what works and what doesn't and not just what works for you know one type of person but what works for the confident one the shy one the married one the single one the career person etc you know they become this chameleon that can knows exactly how to become the person that that person wants so you know they've got that wealth of experience so people go why are they so charming it's like because you know they've got 10,000 times more chances at experiencing it than we do um, and yeah, I mean, sort of, uh, you're coming back to your question, <laughs> you said, so that's why they're charming. But um, the perception people have of psychopaths is is that film Psycho, yes. for a start. Uh, you know, they're sort of stabbing stabbing the shower curtain, the, you know, sort of like the ee, -E -E, as I always say. But the, the, the thing is that he wasn't a psychopath. He was psychotic. And yes. there is a massive difference between the two because somebody who's psychotic has a break with reality. You know, they they have an they don't see the real world. Somebody who's a psychopath is completely rational. They are totally rational. In fact, probably more rational than we are because they're not encumbered by emotion. And so they have the capacity to you know they they know exactly what's real and what's not. They don't think their lies are real. They just don't care. So, I mean, I can give you an inscription of the psychopaths. See, we have two points, the back of our uh, brains and, and just above our ears, kind of like there. And if I sat here and snapped my finger and went snap in front of you, you, you did it just there. Your, your eyes yeah. blinked, right? Even just saying it, not even doing it, 
creates a chemical empathic response in your brain and it's like two hot needles being pushed down into your brain right you feel physical pain at somebody else's pain yeah right and psychopaths don't have that right so they don't you can do an mri on a psychopath and show them pictures of tortured puppies and it won't light up all right with us it light up to varying degrees yes all right and you know so but so to a psychopath they can do anything to anyone without having that physical empathic response they don't actually feel any guilt any remorse any emotion you know they don't have that kind of internal conscience that stops them from doing things because they have no consequences they have no chemical response no consequences inside their own bodies so does does that also mean that william himself obviously has all these children who mm -hmm. I'm sure are all wonderful human beings in their mm -hmm. own right, that he, they're his own children, that he has no element of empathy or sympathy towards no. his own, what he's done. No. They're all, they're all conceived as a means into an end. So they're all conceived to control the mothers. So they're tools to they're him. They're tools, yes. They're tricks of the trade. Uh, when they get old enough, he, he has been known to, to target the children using their connection with him as being a target um so i mean he doesn't mind manipulating them any more than he would mind manipulating the mothers so but that that's not the plan when he when he has them when he has them it's just that that moment because he's not worried about his future self no but it's just that that game in that moment and if you have a child by somebody you're more likely to stay with them they're now the father of your child rather than your boyfriend your boyfriend you can scoot off whereas when you've actually had a child with somebody you're more likely to try and make it work mm -hmm. so it's it's a, tr a trick of the trade it's a it's a tool to be used so he doesn't have any any connection emotionally with his children at all was his was the danger of him uh and his behaviors and the danger of other people like him mm -hmm. your main motivation for writing this book the big yes. Mist? i mean when when i when i first started researching him there's nothing online nothing about him you know there was no there was no recourse there was no nobody had come forward and talked about him at all um so when i came forward with the book and started talking about it it allowed you know everybody i'm basically after the book came out i started getting contacted by new victims so people actually start going oh you know who is this and they google it and they find me and go heck that is the guy who i'm pregnant by who's you know, i'm engaged to who this that, and the other and so he he was put in prison 2000 December 2006 he was given a five year sentence he was deported on the 2nd of May 2009 back to the USA which is where he's from uh, and two weeks later he changed his passport and his birth certificate and his name he was on match.com and he met his first victim and she had a baby in June 2010 um, but she contacted me when she was about five five and a half months pregnant uh, having been left homeless and and finding her bank account was empty um, and uh, I got contacted by three new victims in quick succession after that. And then suddenly everything went quiet for about four years because he, he completely changed his name. Uh, and then I got the, the I contacted by, and I'm allowed to use her name, Michelle, Le Michelle Lewis, um, who was utterly brilliant. She's like me, but my American counterpart. And she's happy to talk about it. She talks about it online. We've done a lot of TV together and stuff like that. Um, but we set her up with hidden cameras. And she she did the undercover work with him. She got him to talk and and say explain everything away rationally and reasonably wow. about you know how there was this book written about him etc. Without knowing that he was being recorded. So she had you you set up a sting operation. Yes. On a psychopath who sets up his own sting operation. Yes. And uh, she used that evidence with the police, and he took a three year plea That's deal uh, for fraud. She actually had him arrested for sexual assault by deception, but the charges didn't stick because mm -hmm. it's still too much of a gray area. But she's trying to get the law changed in America for that. So it's like, I we actually, between us, we set up a, a Facebook group just for his victims. So we actually have a Facebook group of just his victims. And we, I mean, that's been incredible because that allows us to talk to each other. Um, and, you know, sort of like we'd never met each other. But, yes. you know, we are firm friends. And, you know, whenever we're having issues around in new partners or anything else, we're able to talk to each other and say what our fears are and things. Like that. It's the best therapy group you could have. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's been incredible. And it's like the new victims coming forward all the time. There's a, a 19 year old, uh, she was 18 at the time, who had a baby by him 1st of August 2019. Uh, and he's adorable, you know. So <laughs> but yeah, so it's like he, he was passing himself off as in his 30s and he's 55 now. 
So he's, he's still at it and he will still carry on and he always will. But at least now, you know, when people find out who he is, they can yeah. they can contact me and they can and and we, we try and support any new victims that come forward. Absolutely. And while we're on this topic, I think it's important to, to say that we'll have the link um to to your website um and anything else that, that you feel we need yeah. to to share for people to be able to to reach out and uh, get in contact if they think that they're involved or they, yeah. they know him or he's trying to get in a relationship so yeah. they can do that so that will be in the description below for people and it's um, and it's not just it's not just women he's conning he's conning businesses he's conning, conned millions of pounds out of businesses he's he's conning landlords um i don't think he's ever paid rent he pays the deposit and then it takes people about six months to a year to evict mm. him so he goes from property to property doing that so i mean there's a lot of landlords a lot of business people there's a lot of uh, women you know who are part of this kind of victim group so it's not just it's not just romantically it's everybody comes in contact with it's, fr so. it's, it's frightening the power of someone that uses that level of intelligence for bad yeah it, it's frightening how how powerful they can be one thing you because you've you're having this republished aren't you yes the it's, yes. republished. it's 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 been it's been taken over by a new publisher uh called little a um which is actually the traditional publishing arm of amazon um so it's a new type of publishing which is brilliant and mm. it's being relaunched on the 15th of september which is going to be exciting yeah absolutely in the 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 first um the first time the book was published mm. the the kind of cover of that for me um it's very powerful actually yeah. um with the woman's face in the front and this time you have you have the envelope yes what's what's the meaning behind <laughs> the envelope i think it's i think it's more because of course i didn't design it so um but it's it's more the kind of messages back and forth uh, when they sent me the initial design, it was just two wedding rings with, you know, with the, the envelope. Um, and, and I just went, no, you need a few more rings than that. <laughs> so, yes. But yeah, it's actually the cover design has changed over the last um, 14 years since the book was originally mm -hmm. designed. Uh, and it's actually because so much more is digital now, it needs to be a, a thumbnail image. Yes. So the, the, the face, although I love the face, um, you know, I, I actually thought that with the sequel, The Psychopath, it would be great to have that face because it's not my face but mm -hmm. the same color eye um but the that actually have his face and the two would really match and i thought that would work really well but you know the thing about traditional publishing is you don't really get that much of a say yeah, you could say yeah. you like it or you don't but they don't really don't really do that do <laughs> well but I, yeah so it's it, you know when i look at it I, I do think it's it's the opening of an envelope and everything starting to come out yeah sort of secrets revealed yes kind of thing, yeah so i think that, i think there's a lot i think there's a lot of meaning you can take from the envelope there's a lot of emailing back and forth in 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 the story you know so there's a lot of kind of mail messages and yeah you know etc so yeah has as a you know because i'm a father myself and and whenever I hear stories of any kind, you know, as a husband and a father, I always put myself in that position and think, could mm. I do that? There's no way, you know. Um, and then I start wondering how they can. And again, it comes back to the, the personality. But how, how was he as an actual father when he was there? Oh, when, whenever he was home, he was the perfect house, husband and the perfect father. You know, he, he played the part very well. Um, you know, he used to the hoovering, he used to the cooking. <laughs> Certainly do the washing up without asked. Um, but, you know, he, he was just playing a part. You know, that's the thing. It's like the person I realised that the person I was in love with was kind of like being in love with Captain Jack Sparrow, not Johnny Depp. No, right. I do okay. like Johnny Depp, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. But, <laughs> you know, it's that it's that you realise that it's a completely fictitious character that was made up. Yeah. You know, so, of course, he was the perfect father and the perfect husband. You know, he just happened to not mention that he was married to someone else and, and having relationships with five or six other people and ripping me off for everything I owned. You know, but you know, he was quite he was quite good around the house. <laughs> quite handy. <laughs> quite fun with the children. You know, so there was that there was no um I mean, apart from the fact that he was um uh, manipulating me into believing that our lives were in danger and the kids were going to be kidnapped. So but that kind of it was it was almost kind of Stockholm syndrome that you end up with because you just you think the only person you can trust is him. Yeah. So you end up having this scenario of you don't I mean the first rule of every abuser is keep your victim silent. And his his story about the intelligence services that if I told anybody else I'd be putting them at risk kept me silent. So it wasn't a you know thou shalt not tell anyone. It yeah. was just very insipid and very clever. So you know the first thing I did when when all this came out, actually the other wife had said to me, "Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone we've spoken." So the first thing I did was went out and told my best friend everything that just happened. 
So because I just thought I am not going to be told to be set, kept silent ever again. Yeah. Um, and um, well, I think yeah. it's it's a great thing that you took that attitude because through my research, I was um, on Amazon and reading the reviews hmm. of the Bigamist. It's quite a few. <laughs> there is, and and they're not. Uh, they're they're certainly positive reviews at that. Um, the impact of this book that seems to have had on so many people, yeah. ex, you know, victims themselves, um, even individuals who have not been involved in a story like this, seem to be so thankful for the story being shared and and for educating them on it. The thing that concerns me, just on on a human being level, mm. is the level of manipulation. And as we said before, they're like chameleons that so many people could have a psychopath close to them in their life and mm -hmm. not know it. Yeah. And so many people I would imagine could even review this, listening to this now and say, you know, do I? No, no. And the answer is actually, yes, you do. And they're very close to you and they're manipulating you. Um, and that's why I think talking about this sort of things so, so important. Mm -hmm. Are there any other support networks for people who who, who who need it or can can go and get yeah, it? Yeah, there, there are. I mean, that there's there's certainly there's a, a website called lovefraud.com, uh, which is a brilliant resource for anyone who's not. Uh, they they call them sociopaths, not psychopaths. Although te technically, a sociopath is is made and a psychopath is born. Okay. So a, a sociopath is basically a psychopath that was made by society. So generally, systematic. Um, pretty awful lack of empathy and love in the first five years of their life um so it's usually caused by abuse but by the time they're an adult they're, they're indistinguishable so it doesn't matter if you call them a sociopath or a psychopath it's the same thing mm -hmm. um but love fraud calls them sociopath rather than psychopaths partly because that kind of stabby thing you know that the perception people have of it they find it really hard to say actually i think my partner's a psychopath you know so it's yeah. It's a kind of a less dramatic term, I suppose. Um, but yeah, lovefraud.com is a very useful one. Okay. Um, you know, that there are, you know, people are starting to talk about it. And over the last 14 years, I have seen a massive change. Uh, I mean, particularly with, you know, the, the current American political system, you know, is actually making people talk much about much more about narcissism and psychopathy and, you know, and actually looking at personality disorders in general. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that that's actually a good thing. I think the more we talk about it, the better, because the more awareness we have uh, within society, about it the more chance you have of being protected yeah i was going to say you you, you mentioned earlier being a father yourself and you know th there's a couple of things i would say is one is that if anybody was sitting there going you know maybe i'm psychopathic all right i wonder if I, you know the thing is if you're worried about being psychopathic by definition you're not because a psychopath wouldn't worry about it so that's the first thing i would say and also you know you sort of wondering how psychopaths feel about things so do you drive yes all right have you ever got a parking ticket uh yes yes okay when you got that parking ticket were you annoyed uh yes okay yeah but you broke the law yeah and you got caught yes and you were annoyed about it that's how psychopaths feel about murder or rape they've broken the law it's they no, know what they've fault. done is wrong but it really shouldn't apply to them Wow. You know, it shouldn't really apply to them, you know, and that's in a, it's a really good example because most people, you know, if you get a parking ticket, you got it because you parked illegally. Yes. But it is a really good way of actually explaining how, how psychopaths feel, because most people have that experience and kind of go, oh, I shouldn't have got that. And is it literally how they feel about murder? They know it's wrong. They know what they're doing. They know it's, you know, they've broken the rules, but they just don't think it should apply to them. Does that give you some chills? You know, when you really learned about psychopaths mm. and their behaviors and their capabilities did that that must have sent a chill down your spine to think you know you, you were you were married to, you mm. know you lived with a man who was a psychopath to think that okay he didn't but he could have been very capable of doing that because mm. of his personality yeah i mean that's the thing about psychopaths they are capable of doing anything you know, I think the more intelligent the psychopath is, the less likely they are to be a serial killer because they know if they become a serial they're, they're going to be locked up for a long time. Whereas somebody like William Allen Jordan, he, he sails very close to the legal wind. You know, he does. I mean, like, it's, did you know it's not illegal to defraud your wife? You can actually because you can lie to your wife to get money 
which is called fraud. That's fraud, yeah. But it's not illegal because it's communal property. So you can tell your wife you have cancer. I'm not suggesting you do, but you can tell your wife you've got cancer and say you need money for treatment. And that's not, if you did that to your best friend, that would be called fraud. But if you mm-hmm. do it to your wife, it's not. Um, you know, so he, he could, he, he was never done for the money he took from me. He never done for the 200,000 and he was never done for the 56,000 pounds of debt. Is that still the law today? I believe so. I'm not sure, but I believe so. It's because it's communal property. So it's, it's, it's lying to get your own money, basically, is what it's considered. So, and the fact that I was not actually married to him, it was a big mis- relationship and therefore I was never married in the first place. It was, uh, I think the police said it was a grey area. <laughs> So, but that offers so no... he was never prosecuted for what he did to me. He was only prosecuted for the bigamy. That offers no protection to those who fall victim to this yeah. crime, though. Yeah. So it's like so the fact that the fact that he we, he and I were in theory married um, actually protected him against you know all the money that he took from me, which I think is shocking. I mean, if it's fraud, it should be fraud, regardless of who it's against. What What would you say if he were to one way or the other reach out to you? communicate with you i get asked that a lot actually um and it's a very simple answer absolutely nothing there is nothing that i could say that would make any difference to him mm-hmm. and there's nothing he could say that i would believe so there really is no conversation to be had and he, and to be honest he's not going to contact me at all and the reason he's not going to contact me is because he knows he can't manipulate me he knows i know what he is and so there is no recourse in doing that um you know whereas actually you know, if he thinks that there's a chance that some previous victim, you know, might actually be manipulative, but manipulative Yeah, <laughs> that's a hard word. That's a big word. <laughs> um, but, you know, if he thinks he can manip- manipulate them, then he'll go back to them. But he knows he knows he can't with me. So he's never going to contact me again. Uh, and there's a kind of a, there's a kind of freedom in that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, with other things and, and I may be being ignorant to towards this topic um when i think of things like anxiety stress um other illnesses there are ways that these people can be helped um and in some instances with with certain ones treated and you know become better and go on to live a a good life you know a healthy life that that doesn't sound like that's the case for psychopaths or is it well they don't experience anxiety and stress but can, what Anxi- I mean? Anxiety and stress is a worry about the future. Depression is a worry about the past, but anxiety and stress is a worry about the future. If you don't care about your future self, you yeah. won't suffer from anxiety or, or, or stress. So it's easier to take a feeling away from someone than it is to give them one. Yeah. Right. It's, it's like it, you, because you've got the lack of chemical insp- response in your brain, you can't inject that chemical yeah you can't you can't have it happen at that particular moment that it's meant to happen you know you can't create that reaction it is it is more like um i mean as a personality disorder it's more like autism than it would be like mental illness you know it is it is a condition that cannot be treated it can't be cured you know there's nothing they can do about it there's nothing i mean i it doesn't mean that somebody who has lack of chemical empathic response has to treat people badly. There are people who may be considered um, psychopathic in the sense that they have no emotional response, but they behave within a good moral code and good societal laws. You know, so would we then class those people as psychopaths if they treat people well, not yeah. because they feel it, but because they, you know, they've been taught that. You know, so those people would be class them necessarily as psychopaths. And we have very little research on that because the research being done on psychopaths is being done on people in prisons who have already committed crimes. There's very few people in society who you can actually research. They don't tend to come forward and say, hey, I'm a psychopath, unless they're writing a book about it like Amy Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the, the things that I was amazed with and for me, it's very important to say this, was uh, while I was researching to, about your story mm-hmm. and to, to speak with you, I obviously came across a couple of interviews on online. Um, and there was one where your daughter was present. Yeah. And her words amazed me when she said, it's not personal. It's not. For yeah. her, it's not a personal attack. That was very educational for me. Um, I was also in awe of her, obviously having that kind of understanding of it you know 
when it's not personal, I mean, for you it must be personal. No, it's, it's just not, not personal, personal for him. No, no, it's not. It's not personal for me at all. I mean, it's, it, the easiest way to describe it is, you know, the, the psychopaths are predators and we're the prey. If you think of them like a cat chasing a mouse, all right, it doesn't matter who the mouse is. It doesn't matter whether they're pretty or rich or kind or, you know, sort of intelligent, whether they've got babies. It doesn't matter. It's completely irrelevant. It's just a toy. It's just something to play with. So when you realise that, you realise as the mouse, you realise that it's nothing you did. It, you weren't chosen personally. Yeah. You just happened to be there. You're just the mouse. Yeah, you're just the mouse. And it's like, that's what we mean by it's not personal. When you realise that, you realise you just you, you were just caught in the, the trap of a predator. And, you know, you realise you can actually walk away going, you know, right, I just, I got caught. I got caught by somebody. It's not necessarily something I did wrong. Actually, interesting enough, I've done a... Um, 14 years of research has gone into my next book, The Psychopath. And one of the things is I'm looking at is what makes us the victims. And one of the things I was absolutely fascinated by is the fact that I, I wrongly believed that we have, I correctly believe that we have up to 15% of society as psychopaths or on the scale of psychopathy. I thought before that 85% of society have empathy. You know, because I was going with those who don't have empathy, then everybody else does. But actually, there there's a spectrum of empathy as well. So it's like you have that that sort of going to zero, and then there's a kind of a, a grey area, and then there's you know sort of going up to the. And when I did a, a test of empathy, I score really highly on any empathic scale. And interesting enough, almost all the other victims do as well. There are people like nurses and nursery nurses and mum, you know, yeah. so that they're actually, you know, that they score very highly as well. So these these high scoring psychopaths tend to target these high scoring empaths. And what I discovered was that, in fact, the people in the middle don't become targets to psychopaths because one of the first things a psychopath will do is go, oh, dear, I had a terrible childhood or something. Now, if the person turns around and goes, what do you expect me to do about it, right? Then they don't become a target. If the person who is empathic turns around and goes, oh my gosh, what can I do to help? They become the target. Yeah. So we, we, the people who are that kind of high empathy, and actually really, weirdly enough, it's reflected in the reviews of my book because the ones that actually review it saying, gosh, you know, I can completely understand this, you know, they're, they're empathic responses. The ones that turn around and go, you know, oh, I would never have believed this in a million years. You know, she's so gullible. She's so this. Strangely enough, they very rarely say a terrible book. They go, you know, I'd never be caught in this situation. But, you know, you do get those people and no book is ever going to please everyone. So you have to accept that. But, you know, those people, I suddenly realised, those are the ones in the middle. Those are the ones that would never get caught. Because yeah. they would just turn around and go, yeah, get on your bike, you know, sort of like, I'm not going to put up with this. And it's like, and they're right. They would never get caught, but they'd get, never get caught because of that. Um, and it's it, it sort of made me realise. So it's it's not personal, but there is something about us as victims that makes it happen. And yeah. when you become aware of that, you can stop it from ever happening again. So that... The, the, the Bigamist is a book about the story of, mm -hmm. of, you know, how you met him, your your relationship, what happened, what he yeah. did. Uh, but you're also, you also have the other book um, coming the out, yes. The Psychopath, which is uh, next year. It's that's coming out first of March 2021. It's wow. been slightly delayed, but uh, because of COVID and everything else, but it is coming out. And it's very well, exciting. if this year is anything to go by, it will fly in. Um, <laughs> yes. And that. What what's what's that about? What's that we have to look forward to? Okay, so so the bigamist is six years I spent. It's the story of me and and what I went through. And I wrote it immediately after. I wrote it. It took me three months to write. Six months after I'd found out the truth. So it really is a raw account of 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 everything I went through. The psychopath is fourteen years on. So it's zooming out of that story, mm -hmm. seeing it from a distance. So seeing it in an unemotional way, analyzing what happened after that book finishes, yes. and my recovery. Um, but also looking at psychopathy in general and what psychopaths do and what makes us the victims of them and down to their language. So there is a uh, a report done, and I'm going to be terrible and not remember the name of the people that did it, uh, but it's called Hungry Like a Wolf. Mm -hmm. And it's a psychologist uh, who is a specialist in psychopaths and a psychologist that's a specialist in language. And they interviewed um, 20 psychopaths in prison for murder and 20 non-psychopaths in prison for murder and they analysed their language and the ones that were psychopaths were talking about what they ate that day whereas the ones that were non-psychopaths were talking about the emotion behind it like you know they found their wife in bed with someone and that's why they murdered someone and you know the, but the, the, they actually analysed the structure of the language they use 
So in the psychopath, I'm talking about the, how they actually. So I said what he did there, but I actually in the, in the psychopath, I talk about how he did it, how he manipulated, how he controlled me, how he, you know, and how I had these kind of false memories of things that I thought had happened that hadn't. Um, we're pretty sure he was using a date rape drug um, on me and some of the other victims because there are things, there are holes that we don't remember, there are things that we don't, re we do remember that didn't happen. Uh, you know, etc. and things like that. So there was a lot of there was a chemical manipulation going on as well as a as a mental one. But that that's one thing we were sort of like looking at in the psychopath. So it's it's getting right down and dirty into the nitty gritty of the how uh, and the why and the who rather than what just happened. Yeah. So it's it's a kind of both of them are standalone books. But if you've read the bigamist, the psychopath will make a lot more a mo lot more deeper sense, I think. Um, so I understand, and you've you've may not be able to really talk about this or even answer that your story is in one way or the other going to be coming to us on the television screen very possibly yes so i can't i can't go into detail but um we're hoping we're hoping it's going to end up being a, a documentary series okay so i've done a lot of um documentaries so i think there's been eight one hour documentary is made <laughs> about this story now um which i find phenomenal i think it's amazing um but you know, sort of like that the this this would actually be something that goes into depth and actually looks at again the how and the and the why. You know, sort of trying to tell this story in one hour, as we are finding out, is a difficult thing to do yeah. because there is so much involved in it and there's so much that we we can't, you know, it's like when I do a one hour documentary, I kind of come out of it looking at it going, and that just makes me look like a daft lassie, you know, because you're just doing the headline events. Yeah. You know, sort of like met a guy online, told he was, hey, baby, I'm a spy, believed him, <laughs> gave him all my money, you know, then find out he had another wife, you know. It, it It's like if you have these headline points, you just go, how stupid is this woman, you know? And, and I have had that in the past. And luckily... I've got the confidence to go. Actually, there's more details to that. Yeah. People very rarely the, the people when they, they read the book go, I don't understand how that could happen. You know, they, they they generally say, actually, now I get it. I now understand. You know, but when you read the newspaper articles, you get a lot of trolls. Yeah, of, <laughs> of, of course. But I mean, it's I always think a joy. as well, you know, again, I could be wrong in this. It's just my understanding that with every relationship in life, whether it be a family member, a brother, a sister, an aunt, um, a, a wife, a husband, a friend, there tends to always be even could be a serious difference or a small difference. Mm. There tends to always be an alpha, even mm. if it's just slight. Yes. So typically in my relationship with my older brother, he's my older brother. He's typically the alpha. Uh -huh. You know, I go to him for advice. This can be very, very dif difficult. You know, there's there's a hundred reasons that you could be manipulated by someone. Yeah. Um. I, I I do believe that anyone who doesn't take the time to educate themselves on this for their own protection, um, as as well, um, for understanding is it's coming from a place of naivety if they have that opinion. Um, it's it comes down to mental health as well, mm. manipulation, understanding how that can happen. Um, you know we wouldn't say that someone with a mental health disorder it's, it's their fault it's there to blame much mm. like we wouldn't if someone has you know broken their arm from you know a car accident yes. you know yeah. it's it, these things happen um and sometimes there's nothing we can do about it until yeah. after but i would you know i would really like to thank you for for coming in and sharing your story and uh, oh, your insights been, into nice to you. the psychopath um the link to the bigamist um will be in the description where i believe you can pre-order um, yes, you can. On, um, on Amazon. Up to the 15th of September. Fantastic. Uh, so all the links will, will, will be in the description below for, for the viewers to go and look. And I'm very excited to hear how things develop with the, uh, the documentary series. Brilliant. Fingers crossed. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.